Good morning and welcome to Hope Community Church and our Sunday morning service. We hope you enjoy your time with us. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all this morning. We're continuing our series this morning uh, looking at Abraham and uh, we're looking at people in the Old Testament, in Genesis in particular, uh, as sort of key characters of faith. And we, we've left them to one side for uh, two or three weeks as we've had baptisms and uh, we've had the mission week and such like. Uh, and now we're returning to them. So we looked at Adam and then we looked at Noah. Uh, and today we're covering the, the whole of the life of Abraham. Uh, about three or four years ago I did a series of about probably about 10 weeks uh, looking at the life of Abraham. So we're very much looking at top level and rather than read from uh, Genesis where most of his story is, Genesis chapters 12 to 23, uh, we are just focusing on what it says in Hebrews which was just read to us, the little uh, capture there of uh, what the writer of Hebrews has to say. Um, I would encourage you though to read more of uh, the story of Abraham. I hope that what I say today will encourage you in that. And uh, to do so, I have got some sheets which will be available at the back after, uh, which are just daily readings, uh, seven daily readings, uh, looking at the life of Abraham and uh, picking out some major things about him. Now, Abraham, let me just capture his life quickly. Uh, so Abraham, uh, he was born uh, in Ur, uh, a major city in probably about 2166 BC and uh, he was born uh, a Semite you think of anti-Semitism today okay well Abraham was a Semite uh, he was descendant of Shem and um, Ur was a major city with advanced engineering product projects uh, and complex irrigation systems uh, and such like and he moved to uh, with his family to a smaller town uh, called Haran, some a few hundred miles away, which, uh, whereas Ur is in modern day uh, Iran, uh, uh, Haran is in modern day Syria, so you've got some idea of where he's going. Uh, when he's in Syria, he's moved there with his family, uh, God speaks to him and tells him to go to a land which he's going to show him. So it's kind of this vague sense of where he's going. And as he does so, God promises to him that he's going to give him land, he's going to bring a nation through him, he's going to bring a blessing through him, and in fact all peoples of the earth will be blessed through him. A phenomenal promise. Uh, and so Abraham obeys and goes. And as we look at his life, I think it's a phenomenal life, because we see on numerous occasions that Abraham listens to God, and God appears to him. I wonder if you've heard God speaking to you this week. You know, there's 12 occasions recorded in Scripture on which God speaks to Abraham. Some of them, he appears in a vision, maybe a bit like for the guy on the screen and tested me earlier. For some of them, he appears in person. Now, just imagine having God, not Jesus when he was on earth, but imagine God appearing to you in person. God spoke in person. To Abraham. Sometimes you just heard his voice. I don't know whether that was audible. Sometimes maybe it was audible. Sometimes maybe it was something within in his mind, a bit like uh, Gasky uh, spoke on the video earlier. But Abraham was also very successful. He was a wealthy guy. He had a lot of possessions. He was very prosperous. But he was also generous. He had a nephew called Lot. Now, Lot had lost his mum when he was young. And uh, basically Abraham had taken over looking after him. He watched over him. But Lot was not the easiest of nephews to look after. He was quite self-orientated. He looked for the best for himself. When Abraham gave him, gave him a choice, it was a case of the need to split up. Abraham said, which way do you want to go? And he chose what looked the best way. On top of that, he was the type of guy that easily got into trouble. The places he went to were places where they ended up with battles and wars, and Abraham had to rescue him from those situations. Didn't have to, I suppose. Abraham, in his generosity, chose to rescue him. And then, lastly, is in terms of Lot, is he ended up in Sodom. And uh, in Sodom, Abraham intercedes for Sodom on Lot's behalf, that it would be saved so that Lot himself would be saved. And we read that actually God brings Lot out of Sodom. 
in answer to Abraham's prayers. But there's a big question that lays over Abraham's life right the way through. And it's this. Although God's made all these beautiful promises about the future, Abraham lacks a son and an heir, the son of promise. And we find something of Abraham's patience through his life as he waits for the promise of a son to be fulfilled. But on the other hand, like all of us, Abraham falls into impatience and temptation. And he looks to fix things for himself. And rather than have a child through Sarai, he, uh, he, he sleeps with Hagar and has a child called Ishmael. Much later, he does have a child, Isaac, the son of promise, born in his old age. And extraordinarily, when he's early teens, God tells Abraham to go and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah, the region of Mount Moriah. And Abraham does so in obedience. And the extraordinary thing about Mount Moriah is this, is it is the place where a thousand years later, God would have the temple built. And another thousand years later is the region in which Jesus himself would be sacrificed. Of course, God doesn't actually allow him to sacrifice Isaac. He rescues him in the end. And figuratively speaking, in the reading we read, God brings Isaac back from the dead. Then to conclude his life story is his, the death of his wife, Sarah. And Abraham, in faith, establishes or purchases a plot of land so that he can bury Sarah in the land which God has promised to him. And we'll find that's a plot where in future generations uh, they also bury uh, their, their dead too. So that's a bit of the life of Abraham, quick overview. Abraham is mentioned more than any other Old Testament character in the New Testament. 74 times Abraham is mentioned. That's an extraordinary. And, and Abraham is seen very much as vital character in the Old Testament if we are to understand what it is to live by faith in our world today. In John 8, Jesus talks about Abraham and he's asking who are the children of Abraham. And he, he answers his own question with the fact that the children of Abraham are the people who live like Abraham did in faith, listening to God and obeying him. Paul also picks up on the issue of Abraham. In Romans 4, uh, he talks about Abraham as the father of faith. If we are to look by faith, live by faith, it's well worth looking back to Abraham and what it meant to him to do so. And indeed in Galatians 3, Paul says, those who believe are the children of Abraham. So there's a really good reason to look at the life of Abraham, okay? Because if you are a believer, then in the words of Jesus and in the words of Paul, you are a child of Abraham. Abraham is your father in the faith because he was a man of faith. So what do we learn about faith from this father of faith that we have? Well, the number one thing I think is this, and it captures everything else, is we need to look ahead. We need to look ahead because this world is temporary. God's promises are eternal, but our life on this earth is temporary. You and I do not actually belong here. We belong somewhere else. We belong in a heavenly country. That's true place where you belong. Here, it is a sin-sick world, but we are heading towards a sinless world. Here is a godless world, but we are heading towards a world where God is right at the centre. We have a glorious future. You and I were kicked out in Adam, out of Eden, but we are brought in by Christ into the paradise, into the heavenly realms, into the place where God is. And so in that passage in Hebrews, there are numerous quotations. He says of Abraham, 
He did not know where he was going. You don't know exactly what heaven's going to be like, but you are on a journey there in faith because God has said it's a glorious place to be. He says that Abraham was a stranger in a foreign country. You as believers in Jesus Christ are strangers in this foreign land, in this world today, in the UK. Your key identity is not being a Brit or whatever place you were born. Your key identity is in Christ and it's looking forward your identity is in the future it's in where you're going not where you have come from Abraham he left the town he left the place of civilization he left the, left the highest technology of his day in Ur, and he ended up living in tents this is a guy age 75 okay how do you fancy giving up your house and going and living in tents because God's called you to this is the man of faith. He trusts God. Why? Because Hebrews says, these are the quote, Look, he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He was looking forward. And yet this guy, he was looking forward. But it says there in Hebrews, he did not receive what was promised. We cannot, God doesn't guarantee you're going to get everything in this life. No, we're looking beyond. We have eyes of faith that look beyond. And so the Hebrews writer says they were still living by faith when they died. Because they hadn't received everything they had promised. And when they were on earth, they themselves testified. It says that they admitted that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. It's there in Genesis. Abraham says, we, I am a stranger and a foreigner among you. Because they were looking for a country of their own, it says in Hebrews. Looking for a better country, a heavenly one. If you ever feel dissatisfied with this world, if you ever feel that this world's corrupt, <laughs> cast your eyes on Jesus Christ. Amen. Cast your eyes on where you are going. Yes. Where you really belong to. Yes. You do not belong here. God has prepared a city, it says in Hebrews, for them. And God has prepared a city for you. A beautiful city, a perfect city, a place where God himself dwells. So if we're looking ahead, if we're looking ahead in this world, way, and we are regarding our life here as being strangers in this world, what does that mean for us? How do we actually live day by day? And we look to Abraham. And the first thing is this is Abraham made himself available to God. To listen to God and to be obedient to God. I highlighted earlier, on 12 separate occasions, we read of Abraham encountering God, whether in person to person or in visions. And you see, the life of faith has to look ahead. And as we look ahead, we are going to be with God. Now they recommend that engaged couples communicate with each other. It's no good getting engaged and then just ignoring each other. You are engaged to God. He sealed you with his deposit of the Holy Spirit. Like that engagement ring on you. To say, you are going to the wedding feast it talks about with the Lamb, with Jesus Christ. That's what your destiny is. That's what your hope is. And the natural thing is this, is as a couple prepare for a wedding, they communicate because they're planning together and making sure they are on the same page when it comes to the wedding. Okay, otherwise you end up at different churches or whatever it is, okay, if you don't communicate. <laughs> So let's get communicating with this God that we are going to be with and who's preparing a place for us. That's what looking ahead means for us. Secondly, not only listening to God, but also is loving the unlovely. You see, Abraham loved and cared for Lot. He wasn't the easiest guy to love. He wasn't the easiest guy to care for. He was self-interested. He rode on the back of Abraham's prosperity. He rode on the back of Abraham offering him a choice and chose what seemed the best for himself. Whereas Abraham seems to lack self-interest. He is not concerned about his own wealth and his own well-being. You can have it, he says. It's yours. I will go with the second best. Secondly, this guy Lot, he keeps bad company. Do you find it hard sometimes to love those who are keeping bad company and are constantly bringing themselves down? 
Lot needed rescuing from battles and in doing so Abraham was risking his life and the life of his men as he went out to rescue Lot. He was loving the unlovely. And then as Lot moves into the destruction zone and God says he's going to bring condemnation and judgment on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham spends his time in intercession for the people who are there. To you and I pray for those who are unlovely, those who are difficult in this life. You see, God calls us to hate the sin, but to love the sinner, just as Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ, when he, when he was on earth, he cared for the lost. He went out of his way to communicate with the lost, to care for the lost, to bring the lost what was good. He intercedes on our behalf, even today, it says. Jesus is praying for you. Do you think you are the most lovable person on this earth? Or whether you do or not, okay? Actually, you're nothing like as lovable as Jesus Christ is. And Jesus loves you, and he cares for you, and he has compassion for you. And he calls you and I to do the same to those around us. Thirdly, is listening to God, loving the unlovely. Thirdly, is trusting God despite the circumstances. Abraham had to wait until he was well into his 90s before he had a son. All the circumstances spoke against him ever having a son. As it says in Hebrews, he was as good as dead and Sarah was past childbearing age. It was impossible, but he still trusted God. Living the life of faith is not a life that's based on the circumstances you are facing. Whether it's a constantly running nose like I've got this morning, or whatever it is that is annoying and frustrating for you in life, we are called to a life of faith. A life that looks beyond and trusts God's promises even when they look impossible to be fulfilled. Abraham risks everything in trusting God. He left all his belongings and his city behind and all the networks he'd have had and all that sort of thing. He left it all behind. And then later on in life, he risks the life of his only son in order to be obedient to God. Trust God, whatever the circumstances, whatever looks like maybe the consequences of trusting God, keep trusting him. He is faithful. And that leads into the fourth thing I want to raise under this, which is to avoid shortcuts and compromises. Abraham was not perfect. We are not perfect, but we do learn from his errors to avoid those shortcuts and compromises. He slept with Hagar to have a son. God never promises us things that we should go and sin in order to achieve them. His promises are always to be fulfilled in his way. And sometimes we just have to stand back and allow God to work to bring about what he says will be fulfilled. Abraham had to be patient, but unfortunately it's just that, that day of impatience that brings the consequences of impatience. And you know, the consequences of that impatience can be most unexpected sometimes. For Abraham, it was a broken household as Hagar and Sarah fell out and later Ishmael and Isaac were to fall out. And not only that, but today we have the long-term alienation of Abraham's short impatience. As we find Abraham hostile, uh, a Arab hostile towards Jew. With Arabs descended from Ishmael, it is generally considered and Jews, obviously, from Isaac. What consequences might uh, us making shortcuts and compromises have? And then lastly, I want to say this, is we must act out of faith, not out of fear. At his worst, Abraham operated out of fear. He failed to remember that God's promise would bring him through. So we read, when there was famine in the land, he headed down to Egypt. We don't read that God sent him down there. 
when he's down there, we read he is afraid that they are going to kill him because of his beautiful wife. And so he tells a lie. Well, it's a half truth, but effectively it's a lie, which is his wife is actually just his sister. His wife was indeed uh, a stepsister. And that happens again later on in his life as well, not only in Egypt, but also with Abimelech. You and I need to check when we're making decisions, are we acting out of faith or out of fear? God calls us to a life of faith. And faith is not that there's no fear. Okay? Faith actually means that there is some fear and we overcome that fear with faith. Faith in our living God. So let's conclude. Abraham was not perfect, and neither are we. That's one of the wonderful things about the Bible. The Bible records both the imperfections of people and the goodness. But it was a faith that he had. The main direction of his life was one of faith as he looked forward to what God would do in the future. And he thereby sets the example for us that we would keep our eyes not on this world, but on the things of God, the things which God has promised for the future. That we will live here indeed recognising that we are strangers, foreigners, aliens, temporary residents here in the place where we physically live. We do not lay a claim to the things which are here. They are not what we're ultimately hoping for. They are not what we are destined for. You are destined for something far greater, something beyond. And the life of faith is like a bed of roses. At the earthly level, it's all spikes and things. But up above is those beautiful flowers. You and I are living in that earthly level. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be tough. But keep looking upwards and remembering those flowers which are blossoming for eternity. And as you do so, you will find that you can prioritise listening to God. You are enabled, because these things in this world don't matter, to love the unlovely. You are enabled to trust God despite your circumstances. You are able to overcome the temptation to compromise and to make shortcuts. And you are able to overcome that fear with faith. May God enable each of us to live the life of faith day by day, tomorrow, this week, whatever you face. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.